Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Dauphiny. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library, um, and it is my pleasure to introduce both Cindy Warwick, who is in charge of our Author Talk series, as well as Michael Ricards, who is going to be doing our audio lecture today. Um, before I turn it over to Cindy for the proper introduction, um, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items with everybody. Um, first and foremost, uh, we'll be taking questions at the end of the program today, but you can submit them at any point um, using the questions box in the GoToWebinar dashboard. So please feel free throughout um, if something catches your your eye or your mind and you want to, to ask about it, you can submit them at any time. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with GoToWebinar, uh, this is what your dashboard should look like. Um, if you don't see this dashboard, look for this orange box with a white arrow, either at the top left or right hand side of your screen that will open and close the dashboard. And it's possible that the dashboard loaded closed on you. Um, also, if you are maybe working in another program and put GoToWebinar in the background and you can't get to it, um, there is a blue clover type icon um, that should be at the bottom of your screen in your taskbar. If you click on that, then that should bring up uh, not only the dashboard, but the visual, the visual as well. Um, if at any point during the program you are having problems navigating something or something isn't working for you correctly, please use this raise hand button here. Um, that'll alert me that there is some type of issue or question that you have and I will get in contact you and hopefully we'll be able to resolve that. Um, and as I said before, if you have any questions, there's a questions box here. You can just type in your questions, hit send, that'll get sent to us, um, and we'd be happy to, to answer that at the end of the program. So um, that is everything that I have for you, so I'm happy to turn it over to Cindy for the introduction. Hello, everybody. We're glad that you can be with us today. Um, and uh, this is going to be an audio lecture, which is hosted by the State Library. And it's on Woodrow Wilson, Commander-in-Chief. And I hope everybody's doing well. And our website, I just wanna stress each time, I'm gonna always do this, lists not only upcoming events, but it has program recaps as blogs for past programs. So if you have seen an event on our website and wished that you had signed up for it or you did and, and you missed it, you can look at those past program recap blogs and, um, and find out what, you know, what was what and what happened on that day. Coming up on November 13th is an information session on Medicare open enrollment, and you can register for this as you go to the events program of the State Library website. Now, our next virtual author talk is going to be on December 29th with David Price. Uh, we usually participate in Patriots Week, and I'm not sure that they're quite doing that. Uh, I keep getting uh, some mixed information, so but we are having the virtual author talk on December 29th with David Price. Uh, we've had him twice before on his two other books. He's going to be talking about his new newest book that's coming out actually this month, uh, John Hazlitt's World, An Ardent Patriot, The Delaware Blues, and the Spirit of 1776. Uh, he was an Irish immigrant who was a colonel in Washington's army, and he made the ultimate sacrifice at a pivotal moment in the Revolutionary War, which was during that 10-day period that, uh, that they look at for Patriots Week. Today, though, we have Dr. Michael Ricards with us. He's going to be talking about Woodrow Wilson, as I said. Dr. Ricards is the former president of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Shepherd University of West Virginia, and Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. He also served as the founding executive director of the Hall Institute for Public Policy and the Public Policy Scholar in Residence for the College Board. In 2014, he founded the American Public Policy Institute. Dr. Rickard's public service roles include leadership on the National Skill Standards Board, he was appointed by the U.S. Senate, the New Mexico Council on the Humanities, and the New Jersey Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. He was part of a leadership team dispatched to Kuwait to help rebuild its higher education system after the first Gulf War, and he has worked to establish international education partnerships with a number of countries, including China. He's a presidential historian and political scientist by trade. He's authored more than a dozen books and hundreds of articles and analytical studies of public policy and public affairs issues. Dr. Ricards has also served as an advisor on education policy to a wide range of US senators, US representatives, and governors. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees, all from Rutgers University. Uh, I hope that you will join me in welcoming him today as today's speaker and as we look forward to hearing about Woodrow Wilson. Thank you so much, Dr. Ricards. I'm gonna turn that over to you. 
Good morning. Hello. Good morning. It's turned Good over. Good morning. To you. you can start this sp- the talk there. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, address uh, people who are interested in history, especially on behalf of the uh, great library that you have there. I'm sure we all would uh, wish that it opened up as soon as possible. My topic is Woodrow Wilson as commander in chief. Although there's been a lot written on Wilson and nobody ever did a comprehensive history of him as commander in chief during the American war in Europe, uh, Harry Truman once said that Wilson was the greatest of the great, uh, but his reputation has been sullied somewhat because of his affinities towards segregation Uh, He was born in the South, in Staunton, or Stanton, uh, Virginia, and in 1856, uh, his father was a minister. Uh, They were uh, Scottish Knox Presbyterians, and uh, at a young age, he was uh, uh, sent to then the College of New Jersey, which was a Presbyterian-affiliated college, which later, of course, became Princeton. he was a, received a PhD from Johns Hopkins, which was then one of the most advanced universities in America based on the German model. Uh, he uh, uh, became a well-known political scientist and some of his work is still good uh, today. Uh, he was chosen to be the first lay president of Princeton and did a tremendous job in be, in moving from um, a very traditional southern-oriented uh, Ivy League institution to uh, one in the forefront of American higher education, um, based on his reputation and his tremendous speaking skills, he was nominated by the boss-ridden uh, Democratic Party uh, in, New, in New Jersey, and uh, to the surprise of everybody, was elected. He immediately t- turned on the uh, party and uh, fought them on a battle that he eventually won and made national had a national reputation for it. After only 18 months, he went from being uh, the president of Prince, the president of Princeton University. Uh, to becoming um, the governor and then president of the United States. Uh, He was only elected uh, president because of the split in the Republican Party uh, between uh, President Taft and uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, He ended up becoming a president because he was able to carry uh, the solid South, which had always gone Democrat, and the West, uh, because they were in a spirit of progressivism. And Wilson became, from a conservative academic, he became a leader in the progressive movement. And after a long convention, uh, he eventually um, was successful. We, don't, we know him uh, mainly for his leadership during the war, but we forget he was one of the most uh, accomplished uh, domestic reformers in the presidency. Um, and uh, his record was only surpassed by that of Franklin Roosevelt during the Great Depression, and then later by um, Lyndon Johnson during the Great Society. Um, his activities included uh, uh, a variety of domestic reforms, but the reforms which got him so much support uh, became overshadowed. As he said, it would be the greatest irony if I had to devote myself to foreign affairs, which is exactly what happened. He won re-election by a sliver, which is interesting considering what we're going through now. Uh, by carrying California by only 7,000 votes. And he went to sleep defeated, and he woke up 
reelected. Um, he was in many ways um, a person who himself disliked war. And when the war broke out in Europe, which is called at that time the Great War, uh, it was a massive war between empires in a sense. Uh, Germany uh, wanted to have what it called its place in the sun, and it supported with a blank check in its words, the ambitions also of Austro-Hungary, uh, uh, the empire uh, that it was related to by tradition and also by uh, power. The, that blank check led to an acceleration of nationalism and uh, the increase in the alliance system imperialism and then a vast arms race uh, most of the work that was done on the war was done by the chiefs of staff of the austro-hungarian and of the german uh, empires so it became a battle between their ambitions and that of the french and the german and the french and the british and later the russians um, the uh, war uh, was pretty much seen as a, a series of conflicts that would be over quickly. They were not. Uh, they became ferocious battles with enormous casualties. We only know in many ways of the casualties on the Western Front, but the casualties on the Eastern Front between uh, Germany and Tsarist Russia were even worse were so bad that they led to a revolution against the Tsar, against the Romanov family, and the coming to power of the Bolsheviks led by Lenin. Um, that was one of the consequences of, of the war, the rise of communism. It was a world in which people believed in a social Darwinism of the notion that was survival of the fittest, and they believed that the way to peace was through a balance of power with having enough people on each side so that neither one would want to go to war. But in fact, the balance of power theory, which so fascinates people, including presidents in the United States, didn't work. And it led to a massive bloodbath that destroyed much of the generation in all of the countries uh, and left it deeply pessimistic. Uh, before the war, people believed in progress. People believed in science. People believed in reason. And after the war, they were cynical. They lived in despair. They looked at the empty chairs of their sons around the table. So Wilson, when he faced this war in Europe, decided that his best role was to try to be an honest mediator. And at several times, he came very close to mediating the differences and stopping the bloodbath. But as the war got more and more ferocious, each side felt it couldn't compromise. And so what they did was they ended up continuing the war beyond any sense of of, uh, of uh, decency and, and honorableness. What Wilson did was that he argued that uh, international law, which he had taught at Princeton, by the way, um, had limitations, that it didn't deal with choking blockades around countries, depriving them of food, or of something called submarine warfare, he argued that what the world needed was a peace without a victory. And as the casualties shot up, that became increasingly difficult. He began to move the country slowly towards preparedness, uh, believing that, in fact, he was not going to be successful as a mediator. And then on April 2nd, 1917, he gave his famous speech to Congress asking them to declare war. The reason, he said, was the world must be made safe for democracy, 
God willing, we can do no other. So the war went and Wilson became a true war manager in a way that Lincoln, in the only other previous major war the country had fought, was not. He became a role model, actually, for his assistant secretary of the Navy, a young man named Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who in many ways uh, copied uh, uh, Wilson uh, during the latter conflict. He created what the political scientist Clinton Rossiter has called a constitutional dictatorship. He began to ask Congress for all sorts of powers and to regulate all sorts of uh, aspects of American life. In those days, the railroads were terribly important in tying the country together and more importantly, in moving troops and materiel to the East Coast. And he finally put that under his uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, McAdoo. But he needed to create what he called the Council of National Defense, which was headed by uh, cabinet and lay people. And the most famous lay people person was Bernard Baruch, a financier from South Carolina. Uh, Baruch proved to be very strong in getting the military and the civilian uh, areas to work together. Uh, they regulated all areas of American life during this brief period of time. They even uh, managed to deal with coal and uh, Wilson appointed one of his former students, a college president and a Republican, the son of a Republican, Harry Garfield of President Garfield's reputation. And he appointed to deal with the food question at home, a man who had a proven record of philanthropy, Herbert Hoover. And Hoover's work in, involved to a large extent volunteerism on the part of the American people to decide they were not going to eat meat on certain days or were not going to produce the type of products that they had hoped, but in fact really emphasized the war leadership. Wilson's very important decision at the beginning of the war was he supported selective service, which had local draft boards, which we still have, and he also stopped the use of people buying substitutes to serve in their place, which had plagued Lincoln during the Civil War. Um, his new diplomacy, as it was called, involved something very different. What he insisted on was that the real politic, the balance of power that had so fascinated uh, the Europeans since the Congress of uh, Vienna that didn't work anymore. If it did work, why were they engaged in a great and terrible war if that was such a wonderful way to govern the world that they had looked at? And so he decided to really put forth a different vision, a vision of the, to the world in which there would be a peace without victory, in which there would be no recriminations no matter who won. And he would also emphasize the creation of a new body called the League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations had been an idea, been floating around for a while. and had support of President Taft and President Roosevelt and major finger figures in England. But when he proposed it towards the end of the war, by then the Republicans really wanted to knock Wilson out of the box. He had won two extremely difficult elections and had taken with him for a while large numbers of young Democrats in the House and in the Senate. That's what made his domestic policy so successful. But with the war and the sacrifices that the war bring, brought, uh, Wilson had to decide 
um, what he was going to do. One of the things he emphasized was the creation of, of a committee on propaganda headed by George Krell, C-R-E-E-L, explained the war to the American people and explained it to the foreign peoples as well. So statements of Wilson's war address, for example, were translated into different languages and were smuggled out into European countries to tell people what they were supporting, that they were supporting a war for self-determination. A lot of these countries in the Austro-Hungarian Empire had been glued together over the centuries. Uh, there was no reason for them to continue in this empire that was terribly unstable. Uh, the same thing was true in other areas, especially. Uh, what did self-determination mean? It meant that the groups of people together would decide what they wanted to do. It was the basic essence of democracy. The difficulty with it is to define what is the appropriate unit. Um, you can get it so it's so small, it's a tribe rather than a nation. And Wilson had to deal with that issue. Back home, he had to deal with his own ethnic problem, what he called the hyphenated Americans. Italian Americans and German Americans, Swedish Americans and Irish Americans, many of whom opposed the war uh, because they opposed how their home countries were being treated. The Irish never agreed to the treaty that Wilson finally signed uh, because it did not include uh, Irish self-determination. And they wouldn't support it. And the English were even more belligerent in defending their rights and properties in the uh, in, in, in the British Isles. And it wasn't until Tony Blair that they finally reached even some sort of an agreement to stop the brutalities, which uh, Wilson had in fact encouraged the British uh, to give up some sovereignty over the Irish people. The Italians were not happy because they felt that Italy didn't get what it should have, which were the port cities of Trieste and Fiume. Uh, but in fact, the Italians had been an uncertain ally. Uh, they had suffered so many defeats that they decided to basically change sides. They changed sides and still suffered defeats. They were not an ally that uh, anybody could count on. And so when the, the war was over, their claim for all sorts of indemnities uh, fell on harsh ears. Um, the um, a, a German-American population, of course, was upset that there was such destruction, including the starvation of the German peoples during the Great War. And and then uh, there was uh, the ability of the Republicans to basically appeal to the isolationist sentiment in America. Uh, we had thought because we were separated from an ocean on either side that we did not have to worry about entangling alliances as Jefferson and Washington talked about, that we would stay out of Europe's problems and they would stay out of ours. But as the world became smaller and the United States became more of a national trading partner, it was hard to keep up that guise of strict and total neutrality. Uh, the, the president also made another important decision. He would not allow American troops, to make, American troops to be split up. And so what happened was that he appointed a commander named Pershing, but would not allow uh, the Americans to be split up. The British wanted some American units. The French wanted some American units. And Pershing insisted, and Wilson supported him, 
that he didn't want American boys to be basically cannon fodder for European generals who proven themselves so incompetent at a variety of battles. And so uh, Wilson stood by Pershing and maintained American uh, uh, identity as a separate unit. There are a lot of reasons for that. One is that Wilson knew after the war he had to show that the United States was the crucial ally and he could only do that if the army was in fact one. And he recognized that. He uh, Pershing wrote to him about that, and and he said that to others, that he wanted the United States to have a real presence. So the Americans did end up fighting in a series of battles uh, towards the end of the war, and they conducted themselves well, especially considering that we are a country that did not have a military uh, a militaristic tradition uh, like Germany and France um the uh, uh various battles uh that uh, the Americans fought in were important but the importance of the Americans were their mere presence as Hindenburg said to his German command he wasn't so much overwhelmed by the Americans on the ground. What troubled him was that behind them was a, would come a million more men, and they would surely tip the scales of the precarious balance in the Great War. It was the presence of America that, in fact, ended the war, forced the German generals to indicate that they were through with fighting and allowed the Allies, the British and the French, to prevail. Uh, meanwhile, German, uh, Russia stayed out of it, uh, totally out of it. Lenin gave the Germans incredible concessions um, just to stop the war. And uh, when the war was over, the Russians couldn't figure out what to do now. Were they to demand some sort of share based on their early sacrifices? Could they argue for a share when in fact they had surrendered and were so ignominious in, in accepting the uh, treaty provisions of the German uh, government? Uh, they really didn't know how they were going to um, operate and so they did not become a major presence in the discussions. After the war, uh, Wilson did what no American president ever did. He left Washington, left his job in a sense, and went over on the George Washington vessel uh, to be a part of the peace negotiations. He didn't give it to his Secretary of State, Lansing, who was totally useless, and didn't give it to anybody else. He did it himself. And he prepared around him a group of experts called the Inquiry. And they met and they would provide all sorts of maps and historical evidence of who owned what land back in 1400. Wilson was overwhelmed with the information, of course, but he was terribly well informed. Uh, the people who were at the at the uh, uh, peace treaty uh, held in Paris, but still it's called the Treaty of Versailles because it was signed at that beautiful palace. Uh, the major figures were Clemenceau, who was a, a, a radical uh, newspaper man who knew America very well and was concerned, of course, about the tremendous sacrifices that France had made. He wanted a treaty where never again would the Germans be strong enough to attack France? The British, uh, led by the cynical Lloyd George, their prime minister, uh, wanted to see a end to the war and the protection of the far-flung empire. To him, the breaking up of the empires, especially in the Middle East, the so-called Ottoman Empire out of Turkey, men all sorts of opportunities, economic and social and political, for the British government and for the British people. And so his interest was not 
in a, a piece without victory, his interest is, was picking up the pieces to extend the British Empire. Uh, w Wilson argued that he wasn't interested in any of these pieces. They even offered him some and he refused, saying the American people were not an imperialist country. And the British and French and then other of the minor allies insisted on reparations, money, to pay back for the destruction that came from the German and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The question was how much? And they finally had a, a sum which was very vague. And at the treaty uh, uh, discussions, they began to shove it down the throats of the Germans. The Germans claimed that it was too much. The reparations were too high, but yet they really weren't high compared to what they had gotten out of the uh, out of the Bolsheviks in Russia, or what they had gotten out of France in the War of 1870. Uh, but yet the notion that that uh, those reparations were destroying uh, Germany became a popular myth that was used to great effect by Adolf Hitler. Hitler also used another uh, myth, and that is that the German army really didn't surrender, that the civilians had stabbed it, quote, in the back, stabbed the army in the back, and this should never be ha allowed again. It's a, it's absolutely not true. In fact, the the the, the, the uh, German uh, Kaiser fled the country, and the uh, uh, generals uh, went into hiding. And not exactly the uh, response of a of a major power like uh, Germany. But still, the myth of the stab in the back was important not just for um, Hitler, but for the self-image of the German people. And they weren't defeated, they were sold out. And of course, Hitler being Hitler, insisted they were sold out by among other people, the Jews. So as the uh, Treaty of Versailles was discussed intensely, the president pushed for his League of Nations. Some of his critics have said that the president, in fact, gave away too much. That in order to get the league, he was willing to agree to whatever Clemenceau and Lloyd George wanted. But in fact, that's not true. Uh, he fought hard for fairness. Listen to the endless petitions of people who wanted their own state especially in Eastern Europe, which has always been a tinderbox of conflict. He was he heavily criticized for the concessions that were made to Japan, who had fought. Japan uh, wanted to continue to have a major chunk of China called Shantung, uh, the home of uh, Confucius, in fact. Uh, but what happened was, the Chinese diplomats at the conference didn't realize that their government had already given that away to the Japanese previously. And so when the people at Versailles met, the Japan, the Chinese were extremely unhappy uh, with the decision. And for a generation, they blamed Wilson who was one of the few people who was sympathetic to them. And thus, the treaty at Versailles created another myth, which still is a part of a Chinese life. The Japanese uh, said that any treaty should have a clause in it uh, denouncing racial discrimination. And of course, the Europeans and, and President Wilson uh, wouldn't agree to that. Um, and so that uh, meant they were somewhat alienated too. In terms of the war, it was necessary for the United States to do what it had never done, which is create instruments of centralization. 
they created uh, a Council of National Defense, which was kind of a war council, in July uh, 1917, which is only four months after Wilson uh, wanted a declaration of war. And it worked fairly well. There were some major people on that, especially Bernard Baruch, Newton D. Baker, the the uh, Secretary of War. The administration created a National War Labor Board, which was um, to deal with labor controversies so that production wouldn't be stopped at all. Um, they also asked Congress for an Espionage Act of 1918, uh, which prevented uh, profane and abusive language directed towards the U.S. government, and also um, cut down on dissent throughout the country. Wilson warned that the war would have uh, uh, unleash a spirit of ruthless brutality, and he was right. And his attorney general, it was one of the instruments of that ruthless brutality. On the home front, war always has a peculiar set of changes. Uh, unions began to become stronger, and with the National War Labor Board, they did achieve some progress in wages and hours. Also, the role of women, which has been really overlooked, but they began to become important, not just in taking the place of men in the factories and on the farms, uh, but also um, in serving in the armed forces. Uh, 400,000 women went into the semi-skilled areas in the armed forces, another three quarters of a million women went in for clerical activities. Together, this was the beginning, really, of uh, uh, of the liberation of women from their previous roles. And Wilson, who in many ways was a traditionalist in dealing with women, told the American people and the American Congress they had to support the enfranchisement of women because they had done so much during on the war front. The war also saw the rise of radicalism in the United States. Uh, the the uh, left wing wanted to use the negotiations of the treaty as a way of bringing a new era in social relationships. Uh, and it had an impact, the war, as I said, on civil liberties. We really, for the first time since John Adams went after dissonance. The United States, uh, when it came in uh, to the war, was an associate, Wilson said, not an ally. And he wanted to make that distinction always clear. Um, the average soldier that went over into the expeditionary force was between 21 and 23 years old, was a single man, stood 5'7", weighed 141 pounds. Uh, the mental ages, though, were not as uh, as uh, salutary. 47% uh, of the whites scored below the mental age of 13 on the Army's flawed tests. 89% of the blacks uh, did as well. Um, this was the beginning. The war was the beginning of the use of standardized IQ tests and also the beginning of college testing. Um, it became um, a, a, an American fixation uh, that we uh, still have. All of this took place in 18 months. And uh, the peace conference, which was several months long, was unfortunately at the same time as the great flu epidemic of 1918. It's very similar to what we're going through now. And uh, it began uh, not in China or in Russia. It began in Kansas. And the boys coming over to the ships brought it with them. 
both to eastern part of the U.S. and also to Europe. Um, and more people died in the pandemic of 1918 than in the terrible war itself. Wow. Thus, this year, uh, the, the, this time period, saw the decimation of a whole generation of men who would have been leaders mm. in the next generation of American and Europeans. At the peace conference, uh, President Wilson said he wanted no annexation of territory. He wanted no punitive damages. He wanted no mass movements of peoples like you had at the end of World War II in Poland. And he wanted self-determination for people. He was faced with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, the German and Habsburg empires in Europe, and of course, the end of the Romanovs in Russia. But the demands for t territories were just too strong. Um, Wilson had to be a part of the discussions. Who would get what port? Where would the line be drawn between Poland and Germany? Uh, where would the line be drawn between Poland and Russia, Bolshevik Russia? Um, and meanwhile, while he was doing all of these things, um, he either contracted the virus of 1918 or he had a stroke or both. Uh, he had had strokes before, even when he was a young professor at Princeton, but it became worse and he, he was very, very ill. Uh, others were, were ill as well. Um, so we like to think that these pandemics are basically um, uh, what we have now by ourselves, but it's a long history of pandemics having an impact on uh, the world that we live in. Uh, at home, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, a cantankerous senator from Massachusetts, and Teddy Roosevelt, an increasingly belligerent ex-president, uh, laid plans out to uh, to oppose the treaty without even reading it. Uh, Teddy, yeah. Roosevelt di Teddy Roosevelt died, so he was not a major power, but Lodge was, and Link and, and Wilson got particularly uh, difficult to deal with. Why? Maybe he felt he, he owed something to all those boys who had died, mm. or maybe he was suffering from arteriosclerosis and was less able to make the types of decisions that he should. In any case, uh, he came back. He came back to the United States, tried to get support for his League of Nations and for his treaty, and went on the road, doing what he did best. He was, some people said, the best orator of his generation, better than Franklin Roosevelt, later better than the great William Jennings Bryan. Wow. Uh, but in in his trip in Phoenix, he suffered a massive stroke, was taken back to the White House, and was incommunicado for quite a while. It was during that period of time that uh, his wife, Edith, uh, really became his uh, um, his caretaker, but more importantly, she became the uh, fort through which the water of government flowed. Some people have said she's the first woman president, and she didn't see herself that way. She saw herself as protecting her husband, who lived on several years after his term was over. So what you saw then was the collapse of the progressive spirit, the defeat of the treaty, the rise of totalitarianism, first in Italy, under Mussolini, and later uh, Mussolini's pupil, who later became his master, Adolf Hitler. Uh, it was the beginning of the Second World War. Now, some people have said that, in fact, there wasn't a great war. There was a civil war in Europe that lasted from 1914 
through 1945 that there is a thread of continuity um, between these conflicts. And to some extent, they're right. Um, what we see there is the continued corrosiveness of having an empire. Uh, we see the continued nationalism that was really intent on destroying other nationalities. The League of Nations without the American presence was somewhat weakened. Um, later, Rose Roosevelt's protege, uh, later Wilson's protege, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, created the United Nations, similar in many ways, with its strengths and with its weaknesses. Um, and the Wilson New Diplomacy, which so many talked about and criticized both academically and on the political stump, has had a tremendous influence on American foreign policy. Both Republicans and Democrats have proclaimed that they're Wilsonians. Uh, Woodrow, uh, uh, um, Richard Nixon had a portrait of Wilson that he kept by him. And uh, Kissinger, who believed in the balance of power and wrote one of the great books on it, <coughs> said that the American people, as a people, were committed still to Wilsonianism. And others felt that it was Wilson uh, that led us into other wars that went on and on and have sapped American energy. Uh, so you have a continuation of Wilson's legacy. Even George Bush, the, the younger, uh, argued that we should uh, be Wilsonians in dealing with the Middle East and encouraging the so-called Arab Spring, which also collapsed. Uh, the difficulty with Wilson's foreign policy is that it inspires people to incredible heights, but it's very difficult to keep it going. So Woodrow Wilson became um, a major figure. Truman said, as I have said, that he was the greatest of the great people who had served with Wilson and FDR, so that Wilson was far more inspiring. But also, uh, Wilson ended with a kind of tragedy which is almost Greek in nation and in nature and American by inclination. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Question, um, or more of a maybe if you could expand on a, on a topic. Um, I'm curious about the myth of high. Um, I'm curious about the myth of high reparations. Yes, that's a good question. In fact, uh, it's one that's still debated. The 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 crux of the question is: uh, Did the Allies seek to bleed? Germany too much to pay for the war and they wanted it to pay not only for the destruction uh, but also for the pensions that widows uh, got from their governments to fight in the war. Um, the United States was not a part of that process in the sense that the United States did not support reparations. It did support the final number but when uh, uh, Lloyd George and Clemenceau were asked how much are you talking about, they couldn't come up with a number. And in fact, it looks like that the um, uh, Germans never paid off what they promised anyhow. Um, and Adolf Hitler, in his remobilization of Germany, spent more money on mobilizing the army than they would have spent in a uh, ret in, in retributions. All right, let's see here. Um, opinion about renaming Princeton Wilson School. 
Well, uh, w- Wilson was an incredible college pr- president. He was regarded as one of the best at a time when there were really some superb uh, men who were college presidents. Um, when he died, uh, Princeton University uh, recognized his contributions and they were going to create a law school uh, named after Wilson. And Wilson was a, a lawyer too, not just a PhD. Um, and then they decided that they really didn't want to have a law school at Princeton. Uh, and they were going to create this uh, institute for the study of uh, policy and international affairs. And they named it after him out of respect for what he had done. Uh, but recently, the university uh, has argued that the, his uh, record of segregation, and it was a real record uh, of segregation. When he was president, he told a black student, you know, you really shouldn't apply here. Uh, go to some of the other institutions. Um, and, and they did. They went to Harvard and Columbia. Um, and when he was president, he gave the approval to the resegregation of the federal departments, especially uh, the post office. Uh, what would you consider his greatest legacy? I think his... His greatest legacy uh, was, well, he's got some. I think and domestically, his greatest legacy was uh, probably the Federal Reserve System, which is still with us. Um, and I think that that is, is, is going to continue to be important. It's certainly very important nowadays. And, uh, uh, you know, he managed to get that, that through in a very difficult uh, time. I think that internationally, he gave us a different a vision of foreign affairs, not just the balance of power, but the moral component. And that has, of course, its drawbacks and its positives. The drawbacks is that America is always going to be involved in being a policeman of the world. And we've seen the problems of that. Um, the other, the... the um, uh, the asset of that is that somebody's got to speak up for morality once in a while. Um, one of the big criticisms of Franklin Roosevelt is that he never spoke out strongly enough about the destruction of the Jews. And, uh, and that was a moral failing of his and other people, of course. Uh, but uh, Wilson... Um, uh, represented a different view by arguing that moral values have a place in American foreign policy. Um, there's a myth he regretted the Federal Reserve. Is there any basis to that? I don't think so. I think that... Um, uh, he had a different plan than the one that was adopted, uh, but I think he recognized that there was a need for a central clearinghouse uh, the way uh, European countries had it. So um, he, he, he did stand by uh, the um, Federal Reserve System. He also stood by the advice of his progressive uh, friend, uh, Louis Brandeis, whom he appointed after a long battle to the Supreme Court. He was the first Jewish uh, Supreme Court justice, and uh, um, the the Senate, as usual, was a, not exactly a beacon of toleration in those days. All righty. Uh, it looks like that is it for the questions. I'm just going to come in and, and say thank you so much, 
that was a thank really, you thank you uh, and to the state library thank you it was a very good talk and uh you know pretty appropriate since november you know brings up uh, veterans day and that and we need to remember you know what people have done for this country uh and that and so you know to see him as commander in chief and just to hear the different things and thank you for presenting kind of both sides of showing us maybe some of the flaws as well as you know the good things that were done the library has a copy of my book yes yes we do and if pe people want to buy it then go on amazon right so i want to thank everybody sure I, did, I don't know if i did credit to, to uh, all of his efforts in an hour but i just wanted to touch on some of the major points it, i think you covered quite a few of those major points and i think you did it very well so um, well, thank you for inviting you know, me uh, attendees, I, I hope that you enjoyed the talk and I hope that you'll join us again for some of our, uh, like I said, the, the programs that Andrew uh, arranges as well as our uh, more of our virtual author talks. And I want to wish everybody a good day. And thank you, Andrew, thank you. for all the logistical things that you do as well. Thank you. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.